Hi everyone, my name is Nina. I'm a research engineer at Tortoise, and today with Sal, we're going to present our journey of evaluating LLMs in a clinical application. Seven minutes. Every time a clinician uses our LLM powered application called Tortoise, they get seven minutes to, be, to do what they're best at, which is being a doctor. And today, this is really critical because um, up to 60% of clinician tasks uh, time is spent on computer tasks, such as entering data and um, filling tests and making orders, which can average up to 4,000 clicks on a typical shift. It's therefore of no surprise that 53% of clinicians report that they are burnt out with uh, computer use being one of the uh, leading causes of this burnout. Let's see how Tortoise works. So hi Sal, why are you in today to see me? Hi, yeah, I've been really dialed in the last couple of days, you know, working on this presentation for OpenAI Dev Day, you know, I've been up all night working on these slides. Oh yeah, what sort of symptoms are you having? Yeah, so anytime I open up Canva, I get nauseous, you know, I've been <laughs> having nightmares about Sam Altman heckling me during the presentation, it's, it's been a tough couple of days. Oh yeah, that's pretty bad. So it seems like you're really dialed in, so I'm going to prescribe you some dialysis and also some paracetamol. So now we should see that a tortoise will take our consultation, and we can create some documentation which can be filed into the electronic health record, which is where all the documentation about your doctor's visits is stored. So here we're generating the documentation, and let's now have a look at this summary. So as we can see, it captures pretty well that um, Sal is quite stressed because he's presenting OpenAI, um, and that he's uh, nauseous and he's stressed. And we can also see that my prescription for dialysis, for being so dialed in, and uh, ibuprofen is also mentioned. But one thing to note is that I never said anything about giving Sal some paracetamol. Um, and this is a clinical error, and this can have an impact on our patients. So we have to be very careful of how we use LLMs in production. The typical mantra in Silicon Valley of move fast and break things, therefore, doesn't necessarily always apply to us, because moving fast and breaking things can lead to moving fast and breaking people. It's therefore critical that we center clinicians, which are our end users and are the experts in this domain, uh, to help us design and evaluate uh, the things that we push to production. Clinicians are the typical ideators of uh, maybe some complex workflows that take as the input the consultation and then output a series of documents. And they communicate these requirements to the developers who will implement these in code. And together they iterate together until they reach a good solution that can be uh, pushed to production. However, we have some quite stringent compliance requirements, so obviously our outputs need to be clinically safe, and this means that this process is quite slow and labor intensive. We found that the thing that made our process the slowest was this iterative loop with the developer, and at the time there were no out of the box solutions to put the clinician back into the driver's seat. So we decided to uh, make a platform which broke down these complex workflows into smaller steps called blocks uh, to put the clinician back into the driver's seat. Let's see how we did this. Yeah, so at the core of our architecture, we have the building blocks of what make up an LLM workflow. And our key aim here was to make sure that clinicians and engineering are all sort of speaking the same language when developing these workflows. So when we designed our, uh, designed our blocks, we centered it around the LLM call. We decide our inputs. In most cases, it's usually a medical transcript and our outputs. We also spe uh, specify extra model configurations, such as the model, the prompt that was used, whether it's a structured output. And then this is the general interface that we use when creating blocks and LLM workflows. And a key part of this is that we want our clinicians to share blocks with, with each other and reuse them so we don't have to reuse a lot of work. So we store this within our database and what we do is we ingest all of these parameters, we create a hash and this forms a block ID. So this is a unique representation of a block such that if we change any of these parameters, it generates a new block ID. But if we want to share a block with, a, with another clinician, they can then pull it from our database. So now we've got the skeleton of our blocks. Let's see how we can get them to compose together. Let's say we've got one block which extracts some key facts from a medical transcript, and another block which ingests those facts and uh, shoots out a referral letter. We want a way of specifying how these two blocks can uh, compose together, right? And we initially thought, okay, let's just use the term facts, and that will be the connection between the two blocks. But facts can be very high level. You can have facts in bullet points, you can write them in paragraphs, and that can lead to different outputs down the line. So we need to be very explicit here. So we've decided to actually use the block ID of the previous block to be used as the input into the next block. So we know exactly what's coming before it. And that way, well, we know that these two blocks can be composed when we've got the IDs matched up. 
and now we have our LLM workflow. Let's say we iterate on our info extraction block while still maintaining our current factor letter block. We'll now create a new, say we changed uh, the model, OpenAI's release a shiny new model that we want to use, we might change the prompt slightly. This will produce a new block ID, and we still got our old block ID here. But now we know that because the block IDs don't match, our blocks no longer can fit together. And while this can seem really uh, verbose, like when we get audited, it actually puts us in a great position because we know that when we're um, and we're getting audited for a specific workflow, we know exactly what's happening along the way. Uh, we created a UI to allow our clinicians to create these blocks, um, so that we can create function calling blocks, um, so they can create structured output without having to edit a, a long JSON. And we can also load in some blocks from the Firebase. So what we've got here is a block which um, extracts key problems from a medical transcript in the format which is used for an electronic healthcare record system called EMIS. So the clinicians can load up this block, feed in a couple of transcripts to see how the output turns out, and we can see how it turns out there. So this is a structured output, shoots out an array of problems. But let's say we want to add to this uh, workflow. We can create a block from within the UI. We're going to create a simple LLM block here, which will ingest these problems and shoot out a note in the SOAP note format. So it's important to note here that when we're specifying the inputs, we're actually specifying that we want the block the EMIS problems to be fed in here. Now we've got our block, we can add it to our chain uh, and generate our outputs. And after some generation, we can see that our SOAP note should be coming out in the correct format. And we also have our intermediate outputs being displayed. So we can see what's being produced along the way. So this is our main space where our clinicians will iterate and share blocks. And when they're happy, they can save these blocks as an experiment. So what is an experiment? An experiment is a way that we uh, compare LLM workflows. Let's say our existing uh, transcript letter workflow um, just consists of one block, which takes in the transcript and shoots out the referral letter. And we want to iterate on this workflow by first extracting the key facts and then generating the letter. When designing our experiment, we specify a couple of things. The number of data points that are being generated, how many clinicians we'd like to review each data point, and a baseline to compare the results to. So this framing here is what forms our experiment. And in this example, this is our baseline. Let's see how the generation pipeline works. So we start with our experiment that we specify. We then generate our outputs from our bank of uh, consultations. We then give this to our clinicians. Um, we've designed a data labeling platform which allows them to label hallucinations and emissions, where hallucinations are pieces in the output that are not uh, represented in the input, and emissions are things that the LLM step has missed out. Um, here at Tortoise, we call this Halloumi, um, and yes, we would like to trademark this very shortly, so if anyone wants to use that, please uh, refer to our website. Once we uh, collect our Halloumi, we analyze the results, and unlike in regular life, we actually want to minimize the amount of Halloumi that is generated in the experiments. So if we can see that our experiment has less Halloumi than the baseline, we actually go back to the drawing board, create a new experiment, and iterate from there. But if it looks good, we can go into the product. It's important to see here that this piece of the, of the pipeline is actually the most important part, where we're actually gathering that, those human labels of Halloumi, because doctors have key information that an LLM really can't uh, do itself. Um, we've tried doing LLM evals back in 2023, and they weren't up to par, so we really needed to make this piece important. And it's really important to note that this step is quite time consuming for the clinicians to be looking at the input and the output labeling, and we actually pay our clinicians to incentivize them to do a good job. So we really need to make the most of our resources here. So there's a couple of things that we do to sort of maximize the resources we have available to us. First thing we do is that we store results at the block level. So in addition to getting the intermediate output store, we can actually reuse previous experiments. Let's say we've got a really good info extraction block and we want to build on that and create other different workflows, we don't have to get that info extraction box labels redone. Another thing we do is smart sampling. So this is where we share the random seed between the experiment and the baseline, such that when we're sampling new data points for our experiment, we're actually reusing the same examples as our baseline, so we're comparing apples with apples. And a key feature this allows us to do is we can actually increase the number of data points we collect over time without greatly in increasing the labeling effort. Let's say our baseline is 25 examples, and our new experiment, we want to run 30. 
we'll sample the same 25 and get an additional five, and those additional five are the ones that get labeled. Okay, let's look at some results of how we use this platform to evaluate the clinical sa safety of our product. So as Sal mentioned, we have hallucinations and omissions, which are uh, things that the model generates which aren't present in the original transcript, and omissions being uh, things that are missed out by the LLM. We also make the internal uh, classification of major errors and minor errors, where major errors will have an impact on uh, the clinical outcome for the patient. So we're really interested in trying to minimize uh, the major errors here. I'm going to show you a little example of what a ma major error looks like. So at the top, this, is, this text is actually really small, so I'm just going to explain. Um, this is a consultation where a doctor uh, is seeing a patient, and the patient has uh, flu-like symptoms. And the doctor recommends that the patient just go home, drink some water, have some ibuprofen, and rest. At the bottom, we see an output that was generated by our LLM with one of our workflows. And in red is an error that the LLM made. So in this case, um, the LLM said that we should discuss the use of broad spectrum antibiotics. And this is something that was not said by the clinician, so we would uh, categorize this as a major hallucination uh, as it will have an impact on the patient. Broadly, what we see um, with these plots of our experiments over time is that the volume of hallucinations and emissions uh, decrease as we iterate. But obviously, this is an iterative framework, so things don't always go as expected. And just to highlight um, a point here in our graph, we saw a very major increase uh, in major hallucinations. This happened because our original baseline, we were trying to generate some letters uh, from the transcript directly, and we thought to make the, uh, the outputs more factual, we should just extract the facts and then use those to generate the letter. Using this platform allowed us to very quickly assess uh, that the experiment actually introduced a lot more major hallucinations. So we directly said we cannot push, push this to production and therefore this would have never impacted uh, patients in a real clinical setting. Overall, using this framework has really saved a lot of time at Torsus. Originally, we had two developers that were tasked with co-creating with clinicians and designing the workflows that they wanted to run. And these two developers could go on and do other things that needed to be done at the company instead of uh, writing the workflows as the clinicians uh, could now do it themselves through our playground. Additionally, this had the impact of making our clinicians a lot happier because they were back in the driver's seat and they could design the workflows at the speed that they wanted to and run the experiments that they were interested in. And overall, this had the effect of increasing our shipping time of uh, new prompts, new models, new architectures into production. Additionally, uh, all our labeled outputs have resulted in one of the first uh, large-scale data sets of hallucinations and emissions uh, from LLM-generated clinical documentation. And we are planning on using this uh, to try and automate this error detection and therefore make our product further safe. This will also allow us to do live monitoring and production and, and help flag to our users uh, when errors are made so that they can be wary of them uh, when they are sharing the documentation. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to chatting to you later.